think many of you saw this coming. Some of you were really, really close. You said Elantra N and Sonata N line, but not the Elantra N line. Yeah, the Elantra N line, basically the budget Elantra N. And well, yeah, there is a lot missing from the N line compared to the full blown Elantra N. Uh, I'll go over some of that here in a minute, but here's the new car. I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. It's not that I don't like it. It's just I have to get used to it coming from what I had to this is a huge, huge change. Going from 400 plus wheel horsepower, rear wheel drive, two door coupe to a 180 wheel horsepower front wheel drive four-door sedan it's a bit of a change uh, quite a bit of a change that i'm still trying to get used to now it's not to say i'm not used to having sedan because i had the sho but much like the mustang the sho uh was probably high 300 uh wheel horsepower all wheel horsepower all wheel drive so it launched good at crap tons of torque with the big v6 and then the mustang not being a big engine but making a lot of torque and still a lot of power from the 2.3 liter turbo engine now i went down to quite a bit less in terms of engine and potential so i'm gonna go ahead and uh show you what i'm working with here and the new car so, unlike the full balloon Elantra N, which has a 2 liter turbocharged engine, which is much more closely related in terms of power to your EcoBoost cars, this one has only a 1.6 liter. Yeah, there's a 1.6 liter EcoBoost, which is kind of what this is like, actually. Uh, even though the 1.6 liter EcoBoost was pretty much completely different than the 2.0 and the 2.3, this is about as close to that as you're gonna get. This is pretty much Hyundai's equivalent to that engine. Even Buster's stock was 330 or 332, I don't know, forget the number, it was somewhere around there. Crank horsepower stock, 350 pound-feet of torque. The new 1.6 we have here, though it is the highest output version of this engine in any Hyundai Kia vehicle offered, it only makes 201 horsepower and 195 pound-feet of torque at the crank. So the only saving grace to this car is the fact that it has a dual clutch transmission. This is the first car I've ever had with a dual clutch. That gives you some nice uh, benefits, mainly it being a dual clutch front wheel drive configuration means very little parasitic loss from the engine to the wheels. I would say probably somewhere around 10%. Unlike the Mustang with the 10 speed and it being rear wheel drive, uh, you probably somewhere around 16% loss with that setup. More of the power is making its way to the wheels. So that helps a lot because it needs all the power it can get. Unfortunately, this little engine, it can't go too much and I'm not planning to. So though I am planning to modify it, which will be in a whole nother video, I'll kind of go over my thoughts and plans for the car. I ain't going crazy with it. Not at all. Just to get a little extra pep in the step, make it a little bit more fun and engaging to drive. Pretty much that's all I'm looking for with power modifications or engine modifications because this engine can really only handle uh somewhere in the high 200 pound feet of torque range on stock in internals it's not a very strong engine in terms of how much it can handle it's not a bad engine in fact my research shows that this is actually probably one of the better if not probably one of the best and most reliable engines you can get from Hyundai and Kia. Not saying it is the pinnacle or epitome of reliability, just coming from, uh, you know, a company like this, it is one of their most reliable powertrain setups. So with that, I can't expect too much in terms of overall power with this car, but where it lacks in overall power, it makes up in some other areas. So the cool thing about the Elantra is it's not a heavy car. It might look heavy because it's kind of long. You know, it's not a really compact car, but it's not heavy at all. Though I can't seem to find the exact numbers. I Google some sources say it's like just over 3000 pound curb weight, which is it's full weight with all the fluids and everything. Full tank of gas, nine yards. Some sources from Hyundai 
directly say that it's around 2,800 pounds, which I'm not sure it is. It kind of does feel like it's around 3,000 pounds, though uh, I will have a video taking the car to a scale because I want to see exactly what it weighs with me in it. Full weight, just like I did with Buster. Uh, just so I can have a baseline. It's nice to know. I think it's fun to know all of that. Plus, it'll tell me the bias, the weight bias between the front and the rear of the car. So that's pretty cool. Even if it was just over 3,000 pound curb weight, the Mustang weighed over 3,600 pounds full weight. So you got to think there's a big, big difference there in terms of weight. We're looking probably at over 600 pound difference, full weight versus full weight. So there is also a little bit of an advantage there as well. You know, it doesn't make as much power it also weighs less. Unfortunately, it really doesn't matter. Sadly, just going off basic math, if I were to assume, from what I understand, the modifications I'm looking to do, uh, you're probably looking at somewhere 230, maybe 240, maybe, I doubt it, but probably 230, realistically, wheel horsepower, and that I actually might be generous, but I'm just gonna say that just for now, 230 at the wheels, and at 3,000 pounds, this car still has a worse power to weight ratio than the Mustang did stock. It's not gonna be the end all be all solution for performance. I'm really going to sacrifice a lot over the Mustang. I mean, the HPP EcoBoost was one of the best EcoBoost cars you can buy. So sadly, I'm giving up a lot of that. Now, with that, does it make the car any less fun to drive? No, it's actually a really fun car, believe it or not. It's quick, quicker than you think it is. Uh, kind of surprised me uh, how quick it is considering the power it's theoretically making at the wheels. You know, it kind of surprised me. It will rip. You know, the first three gears, it pulls through pretty hard considering all things, which I think is probably the where the most fun is in this car is the first three gears. After that, you're not looking at too much. Oh, and then speaking of gears, remember how I said there's a lot of differences between this car and the full N? Well, even though they both have dual clutch transmissions, they're completely different dual clutch transmissions, unfortunately. This has a seven speed dry clutch transmission. Whereas the full blown N has a eight speed wet clutch. You know, the benefit of a wet clutch is it's probably gonna last a little bit longer, especially in a performance application. And it's probably gonna hold more torque. It's gonna hold more power and not have problems with slipping. That is a big difference. And then if that wasn't big enough, the eight speed dual clutch comes with a limited slip differential. And this one, unfortunately, open it is an open differential so you will get a one wheel peel out of this car unfortunately so then you're asking yourself well what other differences could there be between the n line and the n well right here is another big big difference is you don't get the big brakes on the end line. You get standard brakes. Are they adequate enough? Yeah, I'm not saying they're horrible. I personally do not like the feel of the brakes. The brake feel in this car is horrendous. I really hate the brake feel in this car. Brake pedal's super mushy, so I don't know if there's anything I can do about that other than upgrading the brakes, which trust me, I already looked into, and it's a couple thousand dollars for a uh, four piston caliper kit that bolts on. So I'm not sure if that will really be worth it to me, something I'll entertain in the future, but nonetheless, that's still another difference between the N line and the N. Oh, uh, well, it doesn't stop there, unfortunately. Those are your biggest mechanical differences, but. And I almost forgot to mention because the list is just so long that the N has an electronic active dampening suspension. The N line, yeah, you don't get that. There's also another difference here on the back of the car. Where the full-blown N has a active dual quad tip exhaust, you only have a single side dual tip exit on the exhaust. And uh, yeah, the exhaust actually sounds pretty good. It actually has a little bit of sound, which is nice, but not nearly enough sound. Not what I'm used to, especially with the active dual exhaust that I had on Buster. So you can definitely guarantee exhaust upgrades in the future, which could probably even be one of the first upgrades I make. And then aside from all of that, the only other big differences are what you get in the interior. 
Coming into the interior here, it's still a nice sporty interior. In fact, most of it is the same as a normal Elantra N. The biggest difference is being the seats. These are nice seats. They still have an N badge on them. They are a blend of leather and cloth in the center, which is actually nice. I actually prefer these kind of seats because they give you the look of the leather, but the comfort of the cloth, which uh, in summer here in Florida is nice because we all know black leather seats in the summer suck. You know, you get in a nice hot car in the summer with leather seats, you sit down and then you get a nice brand on your ass from the seat so it's kind of nice but if you ever looked at the real n seats they are really freaking cool and really really special so unfortunately you don't get that here with the n line but it still comes with its own kind of bespoke seats they're just they're not as nice as the full n but there is actually one piece in this interior that is identical to the full-blown n Elantra and it has the steering wheel. These steering wheels are identical. This is the same steering wheel you would get Which is probably the nicest piece in this whole interior. I love this steering wheel This is one of the nicest steering wheels I've ever had in a car Actually, it is the nicest steering wheel I've had in any of my cars The paddle shifters are really big and easy and comfortable to get to they're not hidden They have a little bit of overhang here So it just has this really nice sporty appearance about it Super nice. Otherwise, you know, a lot of the interior is what is to be expected on a Hyundai vehicle. You know, sadly, this here, even though I love the design of it, which is also the same in a, in a full Elantra N, this is just all Elantras are, have this design. It's just really cheap. Listen to this. You know, I'm, I'm barely pushing on it and it's just, it don't sound like it's gonna make it too long before it cracks and breaks. A lot of the interior is like that. Even though there's a lot of nice pieces in here, a lot of it does feel like crap. Which, why we're looking this way, I know what you're thinking. You're looking at it the same way I am. Yeah. What happened here, Kirk? I thought you didn't like these big digital screens. Trust me. I don't. I didn't buy the car for the dash. I bought it for quite a few other reasons. This wasn't one of them, although it is nice. It's a nice, uh, you know, infotainment system. It's modern, has a lot of nice functionality. It's also kind of distracting. I have to get used to it. So it is what it is. Most manufacturers are going this route today. So if you want basically anything new, you're not going to get away from it, unfortunately. But with that said, I do like how Hyundai implemented this into their car. They have this little cow here that makes it look like it's still a dash panel and instrument cluster and not just a flat screen. And it also has these edges that just makes it look more interesting and not just a TV in front of your steering wheel like Ford did with the new Mustang. Still not preferred, but that's what I got. Speaking of what I got, I got a sunroof, man. I haven't had a sunroof since uh, the Camry. Remember I said I had a Camry, even though you never saw that on the channel. Uh, yeah, that was the only other car I ever drove around that had a sunroof. But out of all the cars I've had in recent time, none of them had a sunroof. I wish they did, but they didn't. I'm happy to have the sunroof again. It's so nice to have. It's just so nice to have a four-door car again. I really love the SHO because not only was it quick, but it was practical. It's a big, comfortable car, you know? I lost all practicality with the Mustang. I gave up a lot in order to have a nice, fun, you know, performance-oriented vehicle. Even though I, I utilized that damn car pretty well, I, I was impressed. Even though it was a two-door coupe, you could fit a lot in it if you were pretty strategic believe it or not all in all i don't think it's a bad car considering what i paid for it i think it offers a pretty good amount for the money considering all things i really wanted a full-blown n if you were wondering trust me the n line wasn't on my radar it wasn't on my radar until i actually sat in it and drove it and i'm like this could work i really wanted an n an elantra n that's always been kind of on my radar uh, before that, it was the Veloster N, but when the Elantra N came out, I just liked it a whole lot more because it just 
was more practical, or for me, it would have been more practical. It was always a car I wanted, and I looked. Not to say I couldn't have got one, but on average, an Elantra N used, this was also used, but Elantra N used was $10,000 more on average than when I paid for this. With more miles, double the miles usually, it made a lot more sense financially to get the N line. And I think the N line still offers a decent amount of fun potential for the money. And that's all I wanted the car to be. You know, Buster was never supposed to be what Buster turned into. I went that route when I had to rebuild the engine. I'm like, well, now I might as well just go down the rabbit hole because here I am. If the engine never blew on Buster, Buster was always supposed to stay how it was. It was never supposed to be anything more than what it was. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed how it was before it blew up. Some bolt-ons and the boost max for a little extra, you know, pep. And it wasn't super fast. And because you didn't tune it, you still had all of the torque limiters and stuff. And so the car would always be pulling itself back and holding itself back. But it still had a good amount of pep for the street. It was still fun. It would still light up the tires. And... That was fine. I was perfectly happy with the car, how it was in terms of power and it just looked good and it didn't sound too bad for what it was. It's probably one of the best sounding two, three EcoBoost setups you can buy, especially straight from Ford. It was always supposed to be just a fun, relatively cheap and affordable daily driver that was also decent on gas being the four cylinder so that's the goal of this car it's not supposed to be this crazy performance car it's supposed to be a cheap economical practical and fun daily driver and i think it can do it no problem like i said mods will be coming to the car not so much for power for other things, which is kind of crazy to think about, but I'll get into that in that video when I make it. Uh, also, I will be making videos on how this car performs stock, how it is, you know, getting some baseline numbers, zero to 60, 40 to 80. Maybe I can find somewhere to squeeze in an eighth mile, uh, you know, run on the draggy and see how it compares. Uh, to Buster when it was stock, or at least when it was bolt on with the Boost Max. So I'd be curious to know, you know, it's nice to know where you start and then where you end up to see the fruits of your labor and where your money goes. So you don't think you're throwing your money straight into the furnace. So that will be pretty cool. But yeah, here's the new car, everyone. Let me know what you think. I know it's probably not what you expected I would get, I think it will all work out in the end. And, um, you know, it's a very interesting car. It's a very niche car. Not many people on YouTube are really doing anything with these. You know, you got your few, you know, straggler videos of just people making videos, but not like a full blown content creator, something like I've been doing. So to be able to offer content for this car, uh, you know, to YouTube, I think will be awesome. I know I want to bring in a lot of people who follow and have this car and, um, you know, should be able to grow the channel even more. And that's exciting to me. So I think I was starting to kind of peter off with what I could do with the EcoBoost Mustang. So in the end, I think it will work out better. And yeah, change is hard sometimes, but sometimes change is necessary to grow. And that's how I'm looking at it. There's always good with the bad, and that's pretty much where I'm at with this. So I think it's gonna finally wrap it up here for the video. Let me know what you think. What do you think about the new car? No, I don't have a name for it yet. Working on that. If you have a name suggestion, uh, put it down in the comments. Let me know what you think. Otherwise, it's gonna wrap it up here for the video. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share with everyone you know, and if you want to see more content like this and you haven't already, go ahead, subscribe to the channel, keep a look out for the next Cars Creative video.